the rapture and eschatology, I, I, I titled this lesson Prerequisites and Precision because there's a lot of prerequisites and really understanding more fully what is eschatology and the rapture and the verses that, um, that support it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a whole bunch of prerequisites just to give you a flavor of just how much it entails. Um, and then precision, I, I talked about um, describing the rapture um, in, a, in a, one of the lessons as well as in an email. But what I want to do is, because there's so much going on, I want to walk through two passages in quite detail to give you a foundation of what is the rapture um, as explained in the Bible. So one of the passages I want to go through is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13-18, that a lot, of, um, a lot of teachers, theologians, commentators would point to. And then I think next week I'm going to go through Matthew 24. Because Matthew 24 is such a key chapter, and within that, a lot of these views could misplace where some of these uh, verses are happening. So Matthew 24 is a very key chapter in just trying to understand what in the world is happening. And especially it's important because Jesus is speaking. So those are like really key words, but then, um, and I'll, you'll see it as I go through today that, wow, some of the, how they interpret um, certain um, phrases, um, especially this, um, this thing of the abomination that causes desolation. And then it says the tribulation, well, is that this tribulation or that tribulation? And it's like, it's almost, there's introduction of vagueness when there shouldn't be. So I want to explain that, okay? So today, um, I'm going to walk through in detail 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. And after that, I want to give context as to what are these views of this rapture that people, some, a group of people believe that is pre-tribulational, that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. Some people believe that the rapture occurs in the middle of the tribulation, which is a seven-year period. Some people believe that the rapture occurs pre-wrath, which is about three-quarters of the tribulation. And some people believe that the rapture occurs after the tribulation, post-tribulation. Okay, those are four views, and sometimes uh, it can be very kind of disheartening as you read so many different views and uh, there are websites and groups that are kind of dedicated to <laughs> spending a lot of energy on these views so um, if you want to explore you can go down a rabbit trail of a thousand hours easily into any one of these and so but I want what I want to do is give you this kind of explanation so that at least you have this to go by and then if you want to look at these other views you can try to um, compare it with what I'm going to present so that you don't want to just evaluate it based on one thing and um, I'll, it'll, it'll be more clear as I go through this and then there's a lot of prerequisites and uh, it's such a deep topic because um, there's, it's throughout the whole Bible so um, when you look at some of these views, they focus on, for example, what is the trumpet? Is it the last trump? Is it the trumpets in Revelation and so forth? And they focus on one term, but really, if you want to understand and kind of walk through the rapture and eschatology, there's actually a lot of things beyond just the trumpet that you have to consider. And I'm going to give you some of those terms. Um, and then I was too ambitious. We're not going to get to Matthew 24 um, today. <laughs> All right. So the rapture explained. I'm going to walk you through. So if you want to follow along, you can turn to First Thessalonians 4. Okay. All right. So this is the passage we're going to go through. And the Apostle Paul 
is talking to the Thessalonian believers and just to give you just a little bit of background it's amazing how much the Thessalonians learn in the short time that the Apostle Paul was there um, some commentators have said that Paul was only there three to four weeks and in three to four weeks he taught Thessalonians many things and um, and probably including the rapture here because he's in verse 13 he's saying that we do not want you to be uninformed or we don't want you to be ignorant ignorant of what of these things so what are um, let's read this through and then I want to give you what are the Thessalonians what are their questions what is Paul addressing by this passage all right so let's read the passage first so don't don't want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep they're concerned about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope since we believe that jesus died and rose again even so through jesus god will bring with him those who have fallen asleep okay for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left on earth, until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, some translation says with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, okay, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And we will, we will always be with the Lord. And then it ends with a very encouraging verse, which we need to consider when, when we consider these other views, which is, therefore, encourage one another with these words. With the other views, will we be encouraged or not? That's going to be a, a, a test, a question of those other views, okay? Because it's, this message is supposed to be encouraging, right? So what are the questions that uh, the Thessalonians believers have about the rapture? They're wondering, what happens to Christians who have died? Did they miss the rapture? That's one of the questions they wonder. Are they going to be disembodied spirits in eternity? Are they just going to, is that where, um, how they're going to be, All right? Are the Christians who have died before the rapture a different class or group of saints? Are they like a diff different group because they died before the rapture or not? So these are questions that are, that um, Paul's trying to answer. Are they going to miss the great reunion of believers in, in the future in heaven? Because... They don't know where the ones that have died, the ones that have fallen asleep, where are, where are they? Where will they be? So Paul is trying to answer that. Basically, in summary, what is going to happen to those who died in relation to us? They're concerned about the ones that have died before them. Right. So let's, let's look at it step by step. So those who are asleep... Um, we do not want you to be ignorant, uninformed about those who are asleep. So, first fact is that the soul is not asleep. The Bible does not teach soul sleep. So when, some of this might be very elementary, but I want to kind of state these so that it clarifies um, what Paul is saying. Because um, absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul desires to, to depart and be with Christ. So when a person passes away, the soul is with the Lord. So that th these two verses establish that. So when a believer in Christ died, the spirit goes immediately to be with the Lord, experience a conscience, conscious fellowship with him. Their bodies are, we'll say, temporary sleep in the grave, waiting for the rapture. So that's the, what is talking about asleep or not. So the sleep is referring to the body, not to the spirit. So we'll kind of lay that fact out. Okay. Next is um, 
we have hope. So knowing that, knowing that those that have died, their souls are with, with God in heaven, they do not need to grieve as others do because they have hope that they're in heaven, right? So this message is to give you hope, is not to grieve. So the op what is the object of the hope? The object of the hope is that we believe in Jesus, His death and resurrection. That's our hope. Right? And what is the basis of our hope? Is Jesus died and rose again. And it says right there, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So what is the promise of our hope? Through Christ, God will bring those who have fallen asleep to be with Him. So this second half of verse 13 and 14 gives us this message of hope that hey you know we're gonna we're gonna be assured of this all because of Jesus death and resurrection okay next verse 15 and 16 talks about the order of events at the rapture there will be a cry of command a shout voice of an archangel next is the sound of the trumpet of God the dead will rise first and Christ will rise where their bodies will be reunited with their spirits so these are the ones that have died their spirits are in heaven and then at, at this point those spirits will then have a body at the rapture the ones that have died All right. this is same as um, uh, point number three over there so Jesus rose bodily physically and those in Jesus will also that's the, that's the promise of us having um, basically a glorified body when we rapture okay. so that's the order of the events at the rapture Next is, we go back to the beginning of verse 15, it says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. So this is where I want to say, uh, what is Paul saying by a word from the Lord? Paul received this from Jesus. A mystery was revealed to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. So this information is not like some hearsay or some theory or something. This is from the Lord. Very important. And Jesus spoke of this in John 14. He says that, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Again, a message of hope. Believe in God, believe also in me. Talks about, I will come again, receive you unto myself. So this is... These words, when it says from the Lord, is consistent with these two passages that, hey, this is not some make-believe thing or some theory. This is from God's Word. This is from God. This is from Jesus. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So the body that will rise first, that's the body that will rise first. Yeah. That's what I understand. So what do we mean by raised? I mean, are we talking about the skeleton coming out of the graveyard? Because, I mean, not everyone gets buried. Some people get cremated. Some people are eaten by a lion. And then their atoms are just dispersed yeah. across the entire planet. So what are we really talking What body is being raised? What is body in? What is raised in? Yeah, raised is to be with Christ in the air. So raised there the body is the glorified body that you read in 1 Corinthians 15 um, talks about that our current perishable bodies are not fit for heaven we need to have imperishable bodies okay, okay so it's a new body yeah I guess you can say that yeah. <laughs> it's from the old body the atoms and everything that makes our bodies it's going to be <laughs> what's raised. I mean, yeah. yeah, I hesitate because I don't know of a scripture off the top of my head that says that the atoms of your body physically now 
are going to be transformed in a way that it will be imperishable in heaven. Because if we get a new spiritual body, it's not, it's not raised from anything, right? Yeah, the purpose of using body means physical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't know necessarily that the atomic structure of our current bodies is what's going to be recapitulated in the new body, other than to say it would be the same identified light in the material body that will be there. For instance, when Jesus, when Jesus was risen, the disciples of the maids didn't recognize him, right? And you had to tell the disciples in the inner room, you know, it's, it's me, I'm in you know, look at my feet, uh, my hands, feel my side, and then they believe. So there's something about the new body that is kind of really different than the old, and yet we call it a body because somehow the material existence of us does not stay in the ground, it rises. Well, that is the whole thing where, in that case, I was saying Jesus would rise, is somehow the same. Yeah. Right. And that, I think you're saying, we don't really need to go right down to the molecular structures, the atomic structures, some atomic structures, and say it's the same. But somehow, you're right, it's not just spiritual, it's material. Yeah, that, 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 that's the main point. Thank you, Colin. That, that is physical, a physical, physical, bodily resurrected, you know, body. Um, the thing is, you know, if you go down that trail of, well, is it this body or not? Then it's like, well, if somebody died at, let's say, 99, will the resurrected body will be an, a imperishable 99-year-old looking body? <laughs> or will it be a different one? I just want to get into that path of, you know, what will it look like? Okay. All we know is physical because Christ rose bodily, physically. Okay. Yeah. It'll be really good, whatever it is. That's right. Okay. So, um, so some say rapture is a man-made doctrine, but these verses say rapture came straight from the Lord. Okay. This passage, this concept. All right. Next is um, the promise of the rapture. The Lord Himself will come. The Lord himself will descend from heaven. We who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. Them meaning the ones that passed away that got their bodies. And meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. And that's a wonderful promise. Right? So the promise of the return is the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That we can count on Jesus to come. The promise of the resurrection is that we will be caught up together with them. Right? The promise of the rapture is to meet the Lord in the air and be with Him. And all these passages, all these promises are together in one passage. It's one big set of promises in one passage. All right? So, this is our hope. Those who died before the rapture will be with Christ in heaven. Those who are alive will be caught together with Christ. That's our hope. Either way, we will be with Christ. Okay. And uh, sometimes there's a contention of this phrase caught up or rapture. Um, for beginning of verse 17 says... We who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. And that's where, in this verse, is where you find the word caught up. And the reason why some people say, well, rapture is not in the Bible, and, and um, is because the, uh, the Greek word is harpazo. And this does appear in this verse in the New Testament. means caught up, snatched up, or seized. And the word rapture does not itself appear in Scripture. Uh, it comes from Latin words. So when it was translated in Latin is how they get the word rapture using these Latin words, and then the Greek word is herbazo. Okay. And they all mean to, to snatch up, to um, forcibly seize. So this is where the New Testament text supports the concept of a rapture of the church. And um, it's confirmed by raptures of uh, Enoch, Elijah, and Jesus. Yeah. 
How many raptures in the Bible? So you got Enoch, Elijah, Jesus, not Moses. You got maybe Philip, the two witnesses in Revelation, right? So the church, yeah. So there's a number of them, and some of them use the same words as here, snatched up. So it's an exercise you can look into, a fun fact, you know. So, all right. All right. So, so now, with that in mind, now we can look at, uh, let's look at the, the different views of the rapture. I sent this to you in an email. So, pre-tribulational pre-tribulation rapture so to give you the kind of a reference point yes Saints is a separate time of the rapture, okay. and um, I, no, I haven't. I haven't, and it's. I think it's in Daniel twelve one that talks about that. Look at the Daniel twelve will be interesting. There'll be a lot of things there, but the Old Testament um, believers will be at, at a later time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So the um, pre-tribulation rapture has, uh, and we put it in the framework of this is the tribulation is what's the big rectangle. Uh, seven year tribulation where first three and a half years the, that's part of the tribulation in the beginning the second three and a half is called the great tribulation to, to kick this off the antichrist signs a covenant is where the tribulation begins midpoint he will do something that would be called the abomination of desolation which really just um, is an abomination to God. And that's what triggers the Great Tribulation. And then in this view, the rapture occurs in the beginning, before the seven-year period. And with this view, the second coming occurs at the end of this period. So that's two separate events. That's one of the distinctions of this view. And the rapture can happen anytime. We don't know when that will happen. Okay, that's, that's another perspective of this view. And this God's wrath is a, is a topic that is going to be very different in the next views. And this is a, a point of contention that people with the various views have to define. What do you mean by God's wrath? Or is that God's wrath? Oh, no, not really, but this is. And this is how they distinguish when this happens. So this is just one of many points that has difficulty of having consensus as to what it might be. Yeah, Lisa. Um, so as far as the pre-tribe, uh, you know, so then the rapture would be when the pre-tribe is happening, and everything is that after or before the, the Antichrist signs the covenant, or yeah, it would be any time before, before, and there will there will be a certain amount of time before because the Antichrist has to kind of establish himself so that it could be a moment of time or it could be a, a more days of time. Um, um, don't know exactly when that, if what kind of gap that might be. Yeah, but it's V4, yeah. So, um, 
And part of the these views have to have a matching of, well, how do these judgments, whether they're God's wrath or not, and the judgments that are described in Revelation, where are they within this picture? So there's all these factors that any view have to really kind of um, reconcile as they try to explain it. Okay? So this is the first one. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> So this is uh, what they call mid-tribulation rapture. So in this view, the rapture occurs right in the middle, right in the three and a half years when the, um, when the abomination of desolation takes place. So in this view, Jesus will take the believers with him at that midpoint, at three and a half years into the tribulation. And then the wrath of God now is confined to the second three and a half years. So, um, because of that, the first half of the three, the three and a half years, they don't consider that God's wrath. That they don't define as God's wrath is how, is how they could fit this into, well, Jesus is still sparing you of God's wrath. Because they say, well, God's wrath is not in the first three and a half years. So that's how they kind of explain their way um, that you will be spared of any any of God's wrath. They still have the second coming coming at the end. Okay. Um, so in this mid tribulation view, a rebuttal is Revelation three ten says. God, I, or God, in this passage, will keep you from the hour of trial, from the hour of trial or the tribulation that's coming to the whole world. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 is a, is a promise from Jesus that says, I'm going to keep the believers away from this hour of trial, which is the whole tribulation, the whole seven years, not the second half of the tribulation. Okay. Um, that's one rebuttal. You can debate that. One of their arguments is they want to compare the trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15.52 with the trumpets in Revelation 11.15. So Revelation 11 talks about these seven trumpets. Well, verse 15 has the seventh trumpet. And when that seventh trumpet happens, there's the midpoint of the tribulation. And what they're saying is, well, that trumpet, the seventh trumpet, correlates with the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15. They think they're equal. They, they're e making it equal, and because they're making it equal, then that is when the, the, um, this uh, wrath begins and all that. This trumpet is a, is a big deal in a lot of these views. <laughs> and... Um, the, the rebuttal to this is that these two trumpet sounds are different contexts. The seventh trumpet in Revelation, after that trumpet blows, what does that? What happens? It unleashes the bold judgments. So, does First Corinthians fifteen or other passages talk about the subsequent bold judgments that occurs after the trumpet sounds? So that's the context of Revelation. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, the last trumpet, when that sounds, what happens? The rapture of believers. So you got two different situations, like, I can't make it match right now if I use this view. Um, um, I think trumpet is in the sense generic but it's like well what is the last trumpet versus um i'm not yeah yeah i know what you mean i don't i haven't checked that um the the biggest um argument on this about this last trump is um one of the biggest arguments is how is the the term last trump used during that day and um, the centurions the roman soldiers when they hear a trumpet sound would have a certain formation so when they do a certain trumpet sound they would be like you're on guard 
you're about ready for, for battle. Then there's another trumpet sound that says, when you hear that, you stand down, you're at peace, right? So one of the arguments in the pre-wrath is, and this as well, is that they would say, well, well, Paul must be referring to this sound for this, and there's no kind of indication of that. It turns out there's like several different signals for the trumpet. It's like there's four different signals <laughs> if you look at the secular history of this last trump. So there's just a lot of things going on. But the, the biggest context is like what happens in that environment when you use that term. One is talking about the rapture, but doesn't have anything to discuss. Well, you better be careful. There's full judgment coming or there's a, some warning or not. So it, it makes it difficult to equate the two because one is talking about a message of hope and really kind of comfort. And the other one's talking about judgment. So that's how, and this is just one term it, comparing two passages. There's so many other passages that any one of these views would have to um, reconcile. Okay. Um, there's just so much here, and I just want to just touch the surface as to what some of the arguments are. There's probably a lot more within these views. Just want to point this out. This trumpet thing is a, um, is a big part of their so-called um, argument. All right. There's something called a pre-wrath view, and this pre-wrath view says... The rapture is going to happen again, preserving that going to keep you away from God's wrath. So it's going to happen. But they define God's wrath as roughly a quarter or roughly a half of the remaining three and a half years is how they define it. So this is starting to get like <laughs> confusing in the sense of dicing up many things. But basically, this review is saying that the rapture happens roughly five and a half years into the seven-year tribulation period. This rapture happens to take place between the sixth and seventh seal in Revelation. And this is how they define it. And uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of spare you with the details. There's just so much that goes into it. Um, but again, they use this trumpet comparison um, as, as a means to, or a definition of what is the last trump as a means to um, kind of defend their point. Okay. Now, some of the, let me just go through um, some of the rebuttals and arguments. So their argument is that the first five and a half years, when you think about that seven years, the first five and a half years, they don't call it God's wrath. Okay. Instead, what they do is they say, well, that's the wrath of man. That's the wrath of Satan. That's the source of these wraths in the first five and a half years. Okay? It's not the wrath of God. That's their, that's their so-called argument. So God's wrath is compressed in that last part. And the believers will be raptured before that, so they're spared of God's wrath. Okay? So... What is the rebuttal? I got two rebuttals for that. <laughs> Who opens the first four seals in Revelation 6? Jesus, right? Jesus is the one that opens a seal that directs and unleashes these seals. So this is God's wrath. This is not from man. Jesus is the one that is um, heading this up. And he is the one that's qualified to open the seal. So who is qualified to open these seals is the Lion of Judah, is the Root of David, is the Lamb, it's Christ. So this wrath is not from man, this wrath is not from Satan. God is the one that's sovereign and in control. Okay. Now, the second rebuttal in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 to 3 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And when this day in the Lord comes, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come. So what they're saying is there's peace and safety now, but then there's destruction, destruction to come. Okay? Well, if this view is correct, how can they say peace and safety? If you look in Revelation, the fourth seal, a quarter of the world population dies. So how can you say peace and safety and then destruction comes? This view has a lot to explain 
within just this as to how can this order of events happen, all right? So, so there's just a lot of things going on um, that they need to explain and just having placing um, the seals and, and God's wrath and all that. Um, you have to explain many things when you have this one. Yes, Scott. Yeah, I just add, maybe I'm not from the memory of this This is this view um, gained popularity in the 1990s, so uh, it's actually kind of broad spread a little bit, um, widespread. Um, yeah, but it's uh, yeah, it's very new, and I'll I don't know if I'll get to that right now. But what I'll explain on some of these views that is not pre-tribulational, pre-trib is. They violate the doctrine of um, uh, it could happen at any time. Because all these things have to happen, and then, oh, it's about five and a half years. Well, all these things before the five and a half years have happened. So you can kind of estimate when that will be. So the doctrine of eminence is violated in these views. Okay. I mean, in this view especially. Because you can kind of, you already see some signs, you already see some of these seals open, then you kind of know that it's about now <laughs> or about this time that it's going to come. So the doctrine of eminence is really key to like, we don't know when that's going to come. <laughs> All right, the last view is um, that, I will, or last, yeah, the rapture view that I look at is post tribulational post-tribulation, where the rapture takes place after the tribulation. So this puts where the rapture and the second coming is the same event, or at the same time. And their argument is, the church has always faced persecution, and that persecution, God's wrath, is not, is, there's no difference. That's their argument. Okay, in this, among many arguments, there's many arguments within post trib. Okay, yeah, okay. So, even though it says God's wrath here on this on the screen, it's just saying, Well, that's just persecution. This is what you know, we've been facing this all along, but uh, all right, so, um. So the rebuttal is there's a huge difference between persecution and the, the divine wrath of God. Yeah, huge difference, right? So if we, if we follow through on their argument, and they're saying, oh, all this time through all these judgments and so forth, what does that mean? That means the church, the bride of Christ, is going to have to suffer through the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the persecution poured out in the bold judgments, and even through Battle of Armageddon. And then comes the end, if you add Revelation into the picture. So somehow, the bride's going to survive until the very end. And then Rapture comes and to take the church to meet with Christ in the air. That's this view. Because you got to put Revelation in your picture, right? So, um, so here... What's the rebuttal is that it is clear that Jesus took the wrath for us on the cross when he died in our place. So the punishment of our sin was upon him on the cross. We deserve the wrath, but we won't receive the wrath because Jesus took the wrath of God for us. I just think that, you know, and with that we can say, therefore encourage each other with these words in this, in this um, first Thessalonians passage. So the post-tribulation, it's it is um, it's not as popular now, but to for the church to go through all the all the punishment and the judgment in Revelation six to nineteen, and then to be raptured, just doesn't make sense. And um, another argument for that is Revelation six to nineteen is not for the church. The word church does not appear in any of those chapters. Okay. 
leave the walk and then they let them have sinful children, right? So they got a lot of other events they can't explain when they take that view. But then where's the Venus right? For the reward of those fractures. Yeah. Give that a little second hand. Dealing with him for the place he's prepared, right? Because you separate the two different groups of fractures. And so they end up falling into a lot of other traps you can't get out of them. Yeah, I mean, the biggest one that you mentioned, Jason, is like, who's going to enter the Millennium Kingdom if they're all raptured? Right. So, yeah, Colin. I think it's important to distinguish that there are different types of God's wrath. So, like, Revelation 118 says the wrath of God has been poured out right now mm -hmm. because people are. You know, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Which uh, is the truth. Mm -hmm. and, but, and yet, you know, 1 Thessalonians 110 says. He saves us from the wrath to come. So there's wrath right now on yeah. on sinners and rebels against him. Yeah. And yet there's going to be a, a qualitatively different wrath to come. So it's yes. not fair to say there's no wrath now, because there is wrath now. We see mm -hmm. mm -hmm. on here, but it's a very different form of coming. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the wrath that is to come in Matthew 24 is that something that we've never seen to this level. Um, John 3.36 talks about the, the wrath of unbelief. Wrath of God remains on the unbeliever, right? So, yeah, Jacob. It does seem like maybe Revelation 3 and 4, as you look there, Revelation 3.10 talks about that the church will be spared so that I think that the church believers will be raptured. Then chapters 4 and 5, when, when the, the seals begin to be broken, I think in that part is when, the, um, when Israel will start to turn to Christ and then God protects them and seals them. Um, during this period, to to be able to so-called hide the hide the woman in the in the in the wilderness and so forth. So um, the time of um, saving Israel uh, will occur in in the, the tribulation period, um, and that's one thing in many of these views is that we, you have to account for Israel. You know, there's no replacement theology here. You, know, you have to to understand what is God's heart for the, for the people that are um, that he loves and so forth. You know. I'm trying to get my head around this. Um, from my understanding of post-tribulation is that both the second coming and the rapture happens at the same time. Yeah. So I think what some of the theologians out there are saying that how can you say a rapture Yeah, I, well, 
the main I think a lot of it's just you have to show from they have to show from scripture because I, I've read views that there's like four second comings. Oh yes. Right, they go this, this and it's like, well, show from scripture when is within each one that's individual. And as I kind of go through this, uh, I was really mulling this over this whole week. It's like, there's so much I can say, and there's so many things that are happening that I want to distill it to explaining a couple passages really well to give you some foundation, but everything else I kind of want to stay away from uh, because there's, it, was, it would take so much background and context. And that's why I sent an email to you. If you find a view and we can learn together, it's like, you know, what are the key is what are their assumptions? Because as I look at it, it's like, well, I can pick any one of these views, like where's the second coming, two second comings of four, and I can work to try to re do a rebuttal to that. But I want to flip it around. I want them to explain John 14. I want them to explain these things because that's just as, you know, um, needed to, to, to understand. I wish I understand how Galilee went, how that process went from intro to that. Yeah. Because that might be one of the things that give us an understanding of yeah. how this is going to pan out. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's I'm not a Jewish person, so I don't know. Yeah. Of, of historical, what yeah. really did happen during those times. Yeah, so, um, so this is a, uh, I guess a teaser. At the end of all the series, my last two messages on this will be, one, think Jewish. <laughs> and how, would, how does the Jewish mind receive all this in terms of second coming and rapture? That's the second to last lesson. And then the last lesson is I'm going to go through the Jewish wedding. And I'm going to go through each step of the Jewish wedding, how it points to the rapture. So with that, because when Jesus said John 14 verses 1 to 3 to his disciples, it was clear as day to them. There's no need more explanation, but there's so much in just those few verses. And there's just other wedding verses that are in, in Scripture that helps us to understand the framework and the mindset of what is a Jewish wedding 2,000 years ago. So, yeah, I will do that. Okay. Um, let me try to see what I can wrap up here. Um, yeah. So the post-tribulation view does not fit with this because the church has to go through all these judgments. And we cannot be encouraging each other with these words if we do that. Uh, why is the topic of rapture so important? Because it's the one topic that gives us hope and comfort to the believer. It's important. It's very motivating hope. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 53, talks about this... Um, um, perishable to imperishable body and so forth but how does Paul end this passage just a few verses later Paul says therefore my beloved brothers be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord he gives this encouragement as to how does this impact how we ought to live and he says it right after that with the promise that we will have imperishable bodies beautiful beautiful verse and at this point is the rapture is not a secondary issue or doctrine with no real connections to real life. Almost every place in the Bible where you have a statement on the Lord's coming, there's a practical application of how we ought to live. Think about that, right? How we ought to live in the here and now. So different than the second coming, which is loaded with judgment. It's not loaded about practical things of how to live. And if you think about the whole New Testament, and you think about all the authors that write about the rapture, what is the main point is because they're in a serious time of persecution. The authors want to give the readers hope. This is what you're going to have to come. This is the hope of even the Old Testament saints in, in Hebrew 11 where it talks about this is what their place that they're hoping to, even though they've never seen it. So if God wanted to prepare us to um, about the second coming, 
most of the New Testament would talk about that, right? God's a loving God. He would not want, He would not not prepare us. Okay? So, Bible prophecy is, is not written to scare us. Bible prophecy is written to prepare us. Okay? That, that is really key. Um, Should I, should I fly through these? or <laughs> All right, let me fly through these, and then I'll probably say it again. So this next section, um, I want to talk a little bit about eschatology is hard because it's precise, and I want to focus on it is one of the most exacting, nuanced disciplines because there's so many little nuances to get this right. So as you try to study this, um, take heart as to wow, what are some of the things we ought to know if we really want to dissect God's Word clearly, carefully, right? So I'm going to kind of fly through this in the next five minutes or so. Um, prerequisites. These are some prelim preliminary considerations you ought to consider to study and to figure out what does it mean just to get ready for, for these topics. So this is preliminary, okay? <laughs> um, number one, what is the relationship of the day of the Lord to the time of Jacob's trouble to the Great Tribulation? Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this part of it. Just, I'll, I'll say it again, but there's, there's an aspect of just within this relationship of these three terms, how do we fit it all in? What does Jesus mean by he would be uh, meant by shortening the days of the Great Tribulation, Matthew 4, 24, 22? What does that mean within all these views? Okay, so I'm going to say this again. I just want to kind of breeze through this. So, number two, what is the day of the Lord? That's a big term that is throughout all this. It's got a twofold nature. What is the period of time of the day of the Lord? Is it a big span of time? And it's also a specific day. So as you read the scriptures, especially Joel and Zechariah and other passages, you have to understand what is the author using this term for? Is it a certain date or is it a certain span of time? Um, to make it even more complicated, there's a double sense of this. Is it a near-term prophecy for the day of the Lord, or is it a far-term prophecy that this author is using day of the Lord to explain what he's trying to say? Um, so there's a lot of implications of this, and so we need to kind of understand that. Um, this, this passage in Malachi, is, uh, what, is, what is this verse saying? I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What does that mean? So this is just some of the things to try to just even understand this topic. Um, next, the concept of birth pang. We kind of know it, but <laughs> but in the Bible it's very specific. In the Bible and in Judaism, what is birth pangs? Um, how does birth pangs relate to the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 9? What is birth pangs in relation to day of the Lord? In messianic age, birth pangs is a favorite metaphor for tribulations that of God's judgment upon man. He uses birth pangs for Israel, birth pangs for Babylon, Damascus, and Edom. Amazing, he uses it that much, but it's is a way of representing God's judgment, and that's the metaphor that God likes to use. So Matthew twenty four says, beginning birth pang. Kind of, what does that imply? There'll be more death, birth pangs later. <laughs> There'll be even bigger ones later, right? <laughs> Just like as, you know, my wife have gone through labor three times. So, um... Just to give you an example of how to correlate things, um, birth pangs in Matthew 24 with the first four seals, um, practically identical descriptions. So again, this is part of the prerequisites of just understanding. Um, there's something you need to understand about what is the beginning judgment phase of the day of the Lord. There's just so many aspects to this. Um, I think I meant... Uh, Pastor Cliff noted that I was going to teach on Day of the Lord, and he sent me an, an article. 
this is what I make uh, my students read. It's 24 pages of the explanation of what the day of the Lord for his students. <laughs> That's just one turn, so one paper. Um, so there's a lot of relationships. And then the other part about this phase and timing is what is the significance of this 30 days and 70 days beyond the 70th week of Daniel 9? I think Jane asked that question. Um, and it's like, to understand what is this 30 and 75 days, you have to understand this day of the Lord phasing that's in Daniel chapter 12 that, ex that says, well, something's going to happen 30 days after the 1260. Something's going to happen 75 days after the 1260. What does that mean? So this is just a lot of work to just even understand that. So, and then, of course, relationship to the rapture, day of the Lord. Um, First Thessalonians 5 and Second Thessalonians 2 has a great relationship to where it helps un us un understand this. I might go through that, um, but that's another study. So much stuff. Um, and then other considerations, uh, who opens the seal? Um, why is Christ able to break the seal, open it, and look into its contents? And so there's just a lot of more fine details. Um, who's his restrainer? Um, so there's precision required to do all this. Um, I have another set of slides on the on the on these matters, but I'll save that for next time. What I'm trying to just kind of get the point across is that there's so much to understand to because God's word is all there, but trying to connect the dots not only connect the dots, but it's like, well, is any of these so-called theories consistent with Scripture, but with the whole counsel of God? Not just saying, oh, I match this, and I'm done, I'm good. You can't just match trumpet for trumpet, and you're done. <laughs> There's all sorts of other stuff that, that needs to be um, considered. So, I know this end was kind of rapid fire, so I'm going to go through it again in a bit more detail, but also to kind of un to, uh, explain what are these matters that really um, we need to consider so that we, we understand what is the rapture and how it's consistent with all of God's Word. Okay. Any quick questions, or you can send me an email. Yes, Jolly. When it says the Son of Man comes it will be like the days of Noah. Um, is it talking about the rapture or the second coming? Yeah, it's it's talking about um, the second coming in where when you look at the days of Noah, what happened to the people in the days of Noah? There's eight people that went in the ark and there's the rest of the world that were outside the ark. Who lived, who perished. Using that example, go to Matthew 24 and link the two. Who stayed and who left? So, would you want to be the group that stayed or you want to be the group that left? And that's, the, that's why in the days of Noah is used so you can relate it to the two groups of people. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Good question. All right. All right let me close in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time and um, that we can go over these things and it was a loaded lesson with just so many, um, so much information. But it's asked for your spirit to be our teachers. We kind of sift through all this and really take heart of what the rapture means. Um, that we have this wonderful, awesome promise of um, being resurrected with imperishable bodies. That we can um, just. Uh, just cherish the, the passages in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 that uh, one day um, we will be in heaven with you with imperishable bodies that is fitting for heaven. Uh, so God, we thank you for this, uh, this hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.